Welcome to Relay Chain, a podcast produced by Parity Technologies, where we discuss all things substrates, polka dots, and Web3. Today on Relay Chain, we have Harlow Holmes from the Freedom of the Press Foundation, and she's the Director of Newsroom Security. Hi, Harlow. How are you doing? Hello. How are you? Good. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. Can you give an introduction to yourself and like some of your past work? Uh, sure. Um, I'm the Director of Digital Security at Freedom of the Press Foundation, as you mentioned. And Freedom of the Press Foundation is a nonprofit organization out of the United States where uh, we like to call it, or I like to call it, 21st century support for 21st century journalism. And we comprise of like three parts. We do software development. So if you've ever heard of something called SecureDrop, this is a product that sits in a growing number of newsrooms across the globe that connects potential whistleblowers to newsrooms directly, um, leveraging the Tor network in order to ensure anonymity between the journalists and the source. We also do uh, digital security training, which is the uh, the team that I lead. Uh, we're a small team, and we just make sure that you know, like, from using PGP and email to Signal to Secure Drop to uh, whatever else, journalists have the tools that they need in order to maintain confidentiality with their sources. And uh, we also do a large amount of advocacy. So if you've ever looked at the U.S. Press Freedom Tracker, so pressfreedomtracker.us, um, that's our own little newsroom where uh, we document instances where members of the press have had uh, their uh, rights to report uh, challenged, um, to, to put it lightly. And a couple of other advocacy campaigns that include like crowdfunding and general calls to action. So uh, how did you first get involved with Freedom of the Press Foundation? I first got involved with FPF as simply their first digital security trainer. And this was mm, like a little bit more than five years ago. Actually, I met a couple of staffers, including my current boss, our executive director, Trevor Tim, at an event and we got to talking. And before that, you know, I was working in the um, security development space. I had heard about SecureDrop before. I thought it was incredibly interesting. Um, I remember going to like a couple of conferences and seeing their current uh, lead developer speak about the project. And, you know, I had a lot of questions, but also I saw a lot of potential in it. And uh, at this event, you know, we started talking to uh, Freedom of the Press Foundation people uh, about, uh, you know, where it could go, where the need is that I've discovered. And uh, yeah, we just kind of took it from there as, um, once, you know, they had a job opening for somebody of my capacity. Great. And Ed Snowden, of course, is uh, on the board of Freedom of the Press Foundation. Yes, he's the director of our board, actually. The director, <laughs> yeah. And so can you talk a little bit about his revelations and like the impact that they've had on you and Freedom of the Press in general? Yeah. Um, okay, so uh, before I was at Freedom of the Press Foundation, before Ed Snowden was part of Freedom of the Press Foundation, you know, like way, way back, uh, perhaps even before Snowden knew exactly what he was about to discover, I uh, was working in uh, security development. And so I primarily uh, worked on Android. And uh, I was a member of a group called The Guardian Project, which is still very, very much active today, doing mobile privacy primarily on the Android platform um, and developing solutions for uh, anybody working in the civil society space. So human rights defenders, lawyers, uh, journalists, et cetera, activists, in order to like bring privacy to an open source platform and doing all of that development in open. And we, like, not only Guardian Project, but also, like, the entire, you know, like, ecosystem of developers who were similarly minded, 
we all like really, really aggressively like pursued these particular ideals where, you know, we wanted privacy, we wanted confidentiality, we wanted things to be developed in the open so they can be audited. We wanted people to develop community around software that they cared about, that they found useful. And we wanted feedback. Um, meaning that we wanted good faith actors to come in and say, like, this is wrong, you should fix it this way. This needs translation into another language. This, you know, like all of the the ethos of um, open source as I've come to know it. And so, you know, like uh, this was like really, really great. A couple of years later, after, you know, like working within this particular niche of internet freedom, the Snowden revelations happened. And I actually remember when it happened. I remember just like watching the news coverage, refreshing Twitter over and over and over again, like all of this stuff. And what was so interesting about it was we were entirely blindsided by how much we had been betrayed on certain uh, what we thought were fundamental, you know, like facts about our privacy, um, about what we knew about encryption, about how we felt or how we knew encryption worked and that it was entirely being undermined. I remember, this is less about Snowden and way more about me, but I remember being at an event and, uh, you know, everyone was just like a buzz about it. And we were talking about this over cocktails. And so much of the funding that a lot of like circumvention technology or internet freedom technology comes from a variety of like governmental sources. So the United States government, several governments in in Western Europe, uh, they had all like, you know, really, really put dollars into the development of all of these tools. And then to learn that that those same governments were really, really like undermining the work that we were doing. It was kind of like one of these, like the right hand does not know what the left hand is doing. And that for me was personally like really uh, impactful uh, and was an entire awakening for me. And definitely like I mark the Snowden uh, revelations as the event that brought me to more maturity while working in this space. But it was great because in addition to, you know, like understanding a little bit more about how surveillance was undertaken at that time was really, really great gristle for, you know, new ideas and new approaches to uh, discuss it, to teach people about it, et cetera. Um, but it was also just like the moment where I be, I felt like I had gained more maturity within this space. Yeah. I mean, I was coming from like a different angle, actually, that like they had a little different impact on me, which is kind of interesting because um, you're already kind of like in this, in this in- internet freedom movement. And I was actually working for a defense contractor when it came out. And what surprised me wasn't the revelations themselves. It was that all of my colleagues thought that these were like so terrible and damaging. And to me, it was like, well, wait a minute. No, this is like, actually, this is obviously a problem. Like, why is, why am I the only one that thinks this? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And there's still plenty of people today um, who work in um, information security, perhaps, you know, with clearances uh, at the government level and et cetera, who look at like the Snowden revelations as like, you know, so damaging, like how dare he just like share all of the secrets that we already knew, like shit, which I think is just so funny. Yeah. So if we kind of like move into more on like the the journalism parts, just to kind of frame things generally, like what do you see as journalism's role in a free society? Journalism's role uh, in a free society is as old as the printing press itself, as like an an invention. And so uh, people have the right to know. People have the right to know what is going on. And that's, (laughs) you know, like uh, you can't make informed decisions if you don't know what is going on. It brings the world together. Uh, I, I take this as a no brainer. I think that this is like one of the most fundamental needs for just being a human. It's like eating, breathing, knowing what's going on. I think it's kind of a non-starter and anybody who feels differently is 
from my perspective, entirely warped. Yeah, I, like I just read Virginia Eubanks's book, Automating Inequality, and she talks about this a lot as like a, a premise that like openness and political decision making is really critical. And it's kind of easy to not realize like how or the effect that like technology has had in some ways it's been like very liberating, but in other ways it's, it's let people control thing in a way that's like extremely secretive and actually prevented this information from getting out. Sure. I, well, I haven't read the book that um, you're talking about, so I'm not entirely sure about like, you know, that argument and how that unfolds, but it's definitely possible. I mean, we do see this various places where um, certain media sources are, uh, more skewed towards obfuscating uh, rather than illuminating. I mean, there has always been a challenge for individuals to, uh, you know, find new sources that they can trust, that, you know, take, they take a great approach towards, you know, the, uh, the ultimate project of, you know, letting people know what's going on. Um, and that's always going to be a challenge. There are plenty of news outlets that do not play well to uh, that basic um, preposition and their outlets that really, really do. Uh, and so it's everybody's challenge, once again, to find those that do. Yeah. And so you mentioned at the beginning that a lot of journalists have seen their ability to do their job and like get this information out um, challenged. And so uh, I think that's been like increasing, um, not just in countries that we consider to be like mm -hmm. non-democratic, but even in yeah. like Western democracies. And like, how do you think about this shift and kind of like what have been some major turning points? Well, um, I don't know. Uh, I, I wish I were more authoritative um, to speak about like, you know, specific events on a timeline. But that said, like, I do think that this is not a new phenomenon. And so there have been historically like points in time uh, where uh, a free press has been so intimidating to power that power has tried very, very hard to stifle it. So this isn't the first time and it won't be the last. This is happening here right now, um, but it won't happen later. And then even further, it will happen again. Um, and we just have to keep fighting. Um, but recently, I think that like uh, historians will, if you know, there is a history um, after you know this crazy year that we're experiencing. Um, but you know, should humanity not die off, um, historians will look at the rise of platforms um, such as Facebook and Twitter as a turning point in the way that the media has had to reevaluate its reach, reevaluate its funding model, and reevaluate how it presents itself to the public at, at large in order to uh, secure its reach. And this is like quite a shift in the material of media itself. Uh, that has happened several times over the course of history. So we've gone from printing presses to broadcast first broadcast over radio to television to, um, you know, like uh, the 24 hour news cycle with, you know, like cable news and what that means to the advent of uh, the internet being a source of news with like MSNBC pioneering and other organizations like that to the bifurcation of digital first media, such as, you know, like Gawker, for instance, rest in peace, love you. Um, and other organizations like that to, you know, like the focus on, or rather the land grab that had been done by Facebook and Twitter and Google. Um, and so what are we going to do in the next round? I don't know, but um, this is part of a uh, an evolution. It's not just one event. Yeah, you mentioned funding models earlier. And what do you think about, I mean, like journalism or media has had quite a shift in funding models just mm -hmm. due to the internet, but also I think due to other factors. What's your take on that and like a healthy direction that it could go into? <laughs> this is probably not in my wheelhouse, unfortunately. But I definitely do know that during the times when we were focused mostly on print media for the dissemination of news, that was definitely funded almost entirely 
um, pretty much entirely by ad revenue, meaning that people could, you know, like take out a certain amount of space within a printed page. And in paying for that, that would fund the entire news organization. Now, advertisements um, are no longer brokered that way. I mean, like they are for like certain, like still for print magazines, like, yeah, or magazines and of course, like, you know, newspapers. Advertisement is still, you know, like a significant part, but that's primarily not how it works in newsrooms anymore because um, you have to contend with digital properties primarily and you also have to contend with the platforms who have taken quite a uh, a chunk out of the ad revenue just in participation with those newsrooms i really don't know what a successful strategy is going to look like for newsrooms and i don't know newsrooms don't know either uh, and you can see that in the frightening ways that newsrooms have been decimated because of diminishing ad revenues. Yeah, so technology is something that's in your wheelhouse. So we'll go yeah. in that direction. Yeah, we um, can stick to that. I'm not an economist at all. Yeah. So I guess like the way I see it is that technology tends to give everyone more power, like kind of like no matter where they're sitting. So for an individual, like it, it gives you a really powerful voice to like disseminate information that never would have been possible for an individual to do before. But it also gives away a lot of information about you, mm -hmm. um, like metadata, and it lets other people track you down and kind of kills your ability to do so privately. And so mm -hmm. how do you think about technology and its role in journalism and media? Well, uh, I think one of the most interesting things about you know technology in the journalism space um, is the fact that there is always like this duality. As humans, we are not as adept at realizing this particular duality. We live in a media space where data exists for humans for their consumption, but also simultaneously data, that same data exists for computers in their consumption. And the way that we consume these things, humans and computers, they're very different. When you are posting something on, let's say, like Instagram, um, other humans are absolutely absorbing, you know, your content. They are literally looking at a picture. They are taking it in. They're taking in the colors. They're taking in the content. They are forming opinions and affinities based off of, you know, what you post, what you've hashtagged, you know, like all of that. But computers, on the other hand, are consuming that same affinity um, in, in ones and zeros, in uh, like metrics of engagement that have to do with like how long you've scrolled on a thing, what you have clicked through, um, et cetera. And so like the duality between um, the human legible content and the digitally legible content uh, is a pretty interesting phenomenon. Yeah, so you have all this information that, so like when you post something on Instagram, all this information is about there and maybe you only intended really to put this picture out there and have your friends or something look at it and that's kind of like the, what you were going for. But also like machines can go and, and interpret this data and do something with it. And I guess like what effects does that have on people that like they might not know about when they go to post something? Ultimately, I think about it in terms of uh, surveillance in general, uh, the fact that people don't necessarily realize that because uh, the more digital aspects of our engagement are incredibly easy to parse, um, that opens us up to being entirely surveilled very easily and automatically. Surveilled, monetized, bet against, hedged against, and... Uh, I feel like people are awakening to this theory, but uh, we don't have any strategies for uh, revolting against it. Yeah, it's um, I mean, even like ad markets now are run a lot like stock markets, yes, basically yeah. in the browser. Yes. So how I guess, like, how can people use technology in a way that is facilitating and like gives them more individual power, but without letting, say, the kind of like market that's being run in the background on them uh, actually have a negative impact on their life? Um, I don't know. Um, at this point, I'm kind of searching for um, a way forward that is more positive. Immediately, what I think about is, you know, like uh, 
So we have an ad, you, you have a profile. Everybody is profiled um, based off of their patterns of behavior on the internet, however they interact with it. And you pretty much don't live a day um, in your existence without interacting um, and without contributing to this profile. And some, to bring it back to the Snowden revelations, a lot of the dogma that came out of that had to do with like limiting your footprint. You know, like here's an ad blocker. Here's a way to uh, be entirely like, you know, anonymous online. So we're thinking about like great ad blockers like uBlock Origin or Privacy Badger, or we're thinking about obfuscation technologies like Tor, et cetera. However, there's also a footprint that emerges there. Um, and so uh, when you do go to Facebook um, on their Onion site, you are still announcing to Facebook that like, I am this type of person. I've like absorbed this particular dogma about privacy and um, my security and I'm resisting the system. Um, but you're still giving that information to Facebook over their dot onion because Facebook owns that particular site. So even in evading, uh, you know, like primary technologies of uh, identifying people, you are still footprinting yourself in unfortunately, like a certain category of people who care about like the 2013 dogma of privacy. And um, that's unfortunately, very sadly, just a market to advertise to. There are, thankfully, uh, the only like ray of sunshine that I have about that um, is that in my work, I do see that still matter meaning that having people who care about this still protect sources way more than uh, you know interacting with journalists who don't. It does. It works. Encryption works. You know, like anti-surveillance works, but it doesn't always work from like a consumer perspective. Yeah, I, I remember a couple of years ago someone suggesting not to check the do not track preference in the browser because that just like marks you as somebody who doesn't want to be tracked why um, not it just like well, adds I the... mean, like do not track is kind of just like a, a handshake it's a, a not <laughs> not like right. a cryptographic handshake i mean it's <laughs> literally just like two people handshaking and saying like i promise i won't track you and so there are more robust ways to like actually enforce that and to give it more teeth but yeah uh i still do uh, because I I do want that handshake, and I think that you know, like uh, once again, we're getting to the duality of how humans interpret things versus how computers interpret things. As a human, that handshake does matter to me. Yeah, I check it too. Um, <laughs> so I want to read one of your quotes, and then kind of like ask you ask a question. I want I want to ask you to answer it. But like speaking of kind of like these algorithms that are being run in the background. Like, so the fact that these algorithms we encounter are written by one type of person brings up a new question. What kind of software can we make if we change the people who are writing the code? What if these people had different politics? Mm -hmm. And I guess like before you even like answer that, like what I should have asked as a previous question is, is kind of like, what kind of influence does it have or what influence does a person who's writing these algorithms? Because a lot of people think about machines as being just neutral arbiters. And so why is it even important to like consider this? Well, so that quote is like super old, which is <laughs> awesome. And I do think that there is way more appetite nowadays in like the popular imagination for that idea. Gosh, I don't want to be like glib or topical, but I'm going to do it. Like the um, meme that's been going around about Twitter's, um, you know, like card algorithm where uh, mm -hmm. an image that, you know, has a white face and a uh, brown or black face will always highlight the white face being a function of like ostensibly you know, brightness or like, you know, whatever kind of like pixel quality, you know, like algorithm that they baked into this like uh, intelligence is really illuminating um, as far as this goes. And I mean, like we, we all know what this quote means. It's not an, a, a specifically original idea. We've always known that this has been a principle in ethical technology building 
Langdon Winner? Do artifacts have politics? You know, like it goes as far back as that. But still, like uh, now the fact that this has been memefied, this has been memefied, right? And you would even find like, you know, members of uh, the, the development team at Twitter saying like, yeah, okay, well, you memed it, shit. I guess we do have to go back and revisit this algorithm. We've come a long way to getting like not only technologists to accept that, but also for the public at large to understand that. I think that this comes at a very, very timely point, uh, simply because, you know, once again, to go back to that duality of what computers see and what humans see, our legal system, not only in the United States, but coming from my perspective, I see that very acutely. The, the basis of like the algorithm that makes decisions in our country has been unduly punishing, murdering um, black and brown people. And we are revolting against that. And so I do see that duality. Well, yeah, it's kind of like materializing. Like it's kind of been um, machines are not neutral. Like it, it matters like how you write this these algorithms, um, and they can't be completely unbiased. And a lot of this, it, it can sound like theory and, and like, oh yeah, like I understand this in principle, but I, I think a lot of this is becoming like very real now in the last couple of years. Yeah. And I don't, I don't know if I can like add more than that. Yeah. Um, there's also like a, a couple of interesting bits about it. Like this, <laughs> yeah, like once again, coming back to that duality, um, the labor uh, issues regarding the way that these platforms play, like if you think about the labor issues regarding, you know, like the gig economy and its workers, like Uber's platform versus the people who actually drive Ubers. Or um, if you think about uh, the way that Facebook resists actually um, or employs a bunch of content filter people, <laughs> uh, content moderators, and yet refuses to recognize them as actual employees of Facebook. Like uh, these are very, very interesting tensions that are algorithms that have kind of come tumbling out into the human side and we were having to debate them on like a, a more um, human legible philosophical realm and legal realm, which uh, I think is a pretty interesting event in the evolution of you know humans in technology well i think it kind of shows it shows like implicitly that algorithms are not neutral um mm -hmm. just in, in the fact that like people were kind of i feel like 10 years ago everyone oh the gig economy like this is the future like it's going to be so great and like if you're on the side of the algorithm like if you're writing the algorithm that's like matching the uber drivers or like choosing which neighborhoods to send police to and stuff like it very like it works very well for you but if you're on the other end of that where like you're being chosen um mm -hmm. and of course like it's even mm -hmm. bad to like kind of put that in the passive voice like being chosen it, it very much doesn't work for you <laughs> yeah uh that's entirely true oh i have a uh, a funny anecdote i remember uh one time i was in la and i got a a lift i don't use uber i use lyft but there was this driver uh, who picked me up and we were driving and then someone called him and it was like another, like it was, I think it was an Uber passenger. And this woman was like, you were supposed to pick me up. I'm sorry. And he's like, no, like uh, you didn't register. I'm sorry. Like this must have been a mistake. Blame Uber, goodbye or whatever. And then like two minutes later after he hung up, he's like, Oh, by the way, like I've actually modified my app in order to like choose between like between my Lyft pickup and my Uber pickup, which one is probable to pay me more in tips. Um, and so like he accepted both of us and then he just chose me and ditched the other woman. And I was like, damn, that's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, he's kind of like putting another algorithm, like prob probabilistic system on top of it. Yeah, definitely. And then we talked about... Um, Jack Recider's Darknet Diaries the entire way because we're both big fans. All right. Well, that's one that I haven't read. So. <laughs> oh no! You should. It's a podcast. You should listen oh, to it. Podcast. It's really great. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I guess like I'm in this position of like I'm at a company that's making a lot of new technology that's supposed to do 
automated things. What kinds of perspectives or considerations do you think that technology builders should think about when they're making something new? The duality, once again. So uh, I know that your uh, your organization is like heavily invested in blockchain technologies. And so it reminds me actually of a couple of interesting turns of events uh, regarding blockchain and trust. And I don't have any prescriptions on this, but I think it's interesting uh, to think about like the New York Times and several others ventures regarding, uh, you know, like uh, verifying media via the blockchain, um, which is also something that I worked on at Guardian Project a couple of years ago, Um, just, you know, for proof of concept, proof of existence. Um, But what I think is interesting about that, and I remember talking to, um, you know, like one of their developers about it, was that if the New York Times were to, you know, put out some intelligence surrounding, you know, articles, images, video that they post or whatever, and there was just like this little blue check or whatever that says like, this has been verified on the blockchain and like, you know, here's our algorithm and this is how trust works. Still, people who don't want to hear that message, who are on the opposite side of the political or ideological spectrum will be like, fuck that. I don't even care. Um, And so won't accept it anyways. And I think that that's a very interesting tension. Yeah. How do you convince someone to believe that's like a whole nother field? And um, yeah, that's another question. Um, And then then even like, how do you verify something like that's coming onto the blockchain, right? It's still, somebody has to like put it there, right? And um, Well, okay, so I mean, that's interesting. And this is my question to you. Um, Hypothetically, that same person who is reading, you know, like something in the New York Times and this article, this photo that you see in this article has been verified via this like elaborate blockchain backed um, method of verification will still disbelieve what is printed in front of them. But then at the same time, they're going to use Bitcoin in order to buy some stuff because they believe in it. So what does that mean um, in terms of trust? What does that mean? Yeah, I I, I mean, I think like it depends on the information, right? Like, so some information is very easy for computers to like, quote unquote, verify, right? Like if you say like this account wants to make a transaction of like sending some tokens to another account, you can kind of verify that easily by just saying like, okay, well, there's like a signature, like a cryptographic signature. And so therefore, like we know that this desire to send tokens is is true. Whereas like if you say this photograph was taken at this location, it's like, well, someone kind of like posted that and like attested to it. But like, you can't really like cryptographically prove that or you know maybe there there's like better guarantees than like somebody attested to it like photographic hardware that will Mm -hmm. actually like timestamp an image and then like upload a hash of it or something right Mm -hmm. um so i think like there are like some guarantees and you could even have like okay the hash of this image goes along with like in like the actual print and then like the photographer can post the actual image and then it's it's like still okay, the photographer's kind of saying, well, the newspaper didn't alter the image that I gave them. Yeah. Um, so it kind of like shifts the trust to like, okay, well, the photographer, we're trusting that the photographer gave them like an unaltered mm-hmm. image or something, right? But at least that kind of says like, well, that was the individual and it wasn't like the organization who's like corporate owner said like, oh no, you need to change this, right? I, I, like, I don't think there is a, a perfect answer to it. it. It does ultimately come down to trust in a lot of cases. Yeah, it does. It does. Um, also, fun fact, I believe the AP no longer accepts like raw images, like the file format. Oh, really? Yeah. Hmm. It, what do you send them then? JPEG. Interesting. I would never you have guessed that. You can fact check me on that, though. Okay. I mean, I believe you, but um, yeah, I, I think that's interesting. Is that because like they don't want to be accused of altering it? I don't know what the rationale is. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm sure you can do a lot with the JPEG, although I'm not up to date on my image editing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so if, if we come back to like um, digital newsroom um, to kind of start wrapping up, like if somebody wanted to become a source and it might not, not even be directly, like you might mm-hmm. be a source just by being like at a protest and you're being there 
by like your phone being there is kind of like logged into somebody else's report. And so like, I guess like whether you're like a passive source um, or like want to actively be a source, what are the best practices that you would recommend? To be a source. Um, I would say that be mindful of the data that you are dripping um, as you go about in the world and be intentional about how you share and what you share and to whom you share. And there are ways to do that. There's always like a little bit of a uh, contentious question about like whether I should stream, you know, like something that I see live unfolding or whether I should, um, you know, just like record it locally, save it, think about, you know, like review the tape, see who's in the video, see who's who might be implicated and whose permission I do not have before sharing it. Uh, there's that. And I think people do need to grapple with that. There's never going to be a right or wrong answer. So <laughs> be aware of that. But I think that as it's a question that can only be answered on a case by case basis. The best thing that you can do is just like put all of those options in people's heads so they have better, um, they're better informed when they make those decisions. Yeah. And I think what you said at the beginning about just like being deliberate about the information that you're putting out there. Yeah. Um, I probably just even like framing the, the question, like my fault of just like specifically talking about being a source, like whether you think you're a source or, or you don't, like you're kind of always broadcasting this information about yourself just by like the fact that you carry a phone around. Mm -hmm. And um, I think like a lot of what you said can just be applied to that. Like you should think about what your settings are and um, what kind of information you are giving out. Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, there are so many ways to like lock down um, a mobile device in order to minimize the amount of data that you are dripping as you go about in the world. Be aware of surveillance and architecture, uh, meaning like, you know, cameras, but also like kiosks that are grabbing your Bluetooth, you know, address or whatever. And those are just like tiny examples of like other ways that you can be mindful when carrying a device in your pocket as you walk around the earth. Great. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Where should people go to learn more about um, you and Freedom of the Press Foundation? Well, we are always found at freedom.press. Um, please do come and uh, check it out. And also, I highly recommend people going to our Press Freedom Tracker. So pressfreedomtracker.us is a great space to learn about the daily daily um, challenges to reporting in the United States. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Relay Chain. We'd love to keep in touch. Follow us on Twitter at Relay Chain or email podcast at parody.io. Our team at Parity includes some of the leading peer-to-peer -peer networking developers, consensus algorithm inventors, blockchain innovators, and Rust developers. If you want to learn more about our work or want to work with us, visit our website at parity.io and sign up for our newsletter at parity.io newsletter. 